CEO of Hood Paralegal. And we deeply appreciate everyone for tuning in to episode three of the Hood Paralegal podcast. I give all honor to God for providing the platform and my sister Jay Renee and the Prison Riot Radio family for partnering with us to bring this vision to fruition. Now this episode, we're going to be elaborating on the mental health crisis the incarcerated are experiencing and how it constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. We respectfully ask everyone to subscribe, share, and comment because we value your opinion and your voice matter. And creating this dialogue allows us to find solutions and take action against the injustices we are subjected to. And for those who are wondering, yes, we are incarcerated, but we are resilient and we made a decision to execute and lay the foundation before we are released. And decisions define your destiny and we are destined to win. Now I want to start this episode by asking a question. What's the definition of hypocrisy? The answer to that is the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. The DOC mission statement says that the mission is to protect those in their care and to provide opportunities for positive change and success. But their actions are in direct tradition of this statement. In this case, we're elaborating on the mental health crisis the incarcerated are experiencing. The Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution made applicable to the states by the 14th Amendment prohibits the infliction of cruel and unusual punishments on convicted prisoners. Now, the same principles that apply to health care applies to mental health care. Now, some of the elements of an adequate mental health care system are, number one, there must be a systematic program for screening and evaluating inmates in order to identify those who require mental health treatment. Number two, the treatment must entail more than segregation and close supervision of the inmate. Number three, the treatment requires the participation of trained mental health professionals who must be employed in sufficient numbers to identify and treat in an individualized manner those treatable inmates suffering from serious mental disorders. Number four, accurate, complete, and confidential records of the mental health treatment process must be maintained. Number five, prescription and administration of behavior altering medications in dangerous amounts by dangerous methods or without appropriate supervision. A periodic evaluation is an unacceptable method of treatment. Number six, a basic program for the identification, treatment, and supervision of inmates with suicidal tendencies is a necessary component of any mental health program. Now, some of the examples of deficiencies in mental health care treatment that have been found that violate the Eighth Amendment are, number one, lack of adequate mental health screening on intake. Number two, failure to follow up on prisoners with known or suspected mental health disorders. Number three, failure to provide adequate numbers of qualified mental health staff. Number four, housing mentally ill prisoners in segregation or supermax units. Number five, failure to transfer seriously mentally ill prisoners to more appropriate facilities. Number six, improper use of restraints. Number seven, excessive use of force against mentally ill prisoners. Number eight, lack of training of custody staff and mental health issues. Number five, number nine, excuse me, exposure to excessive heat in combination with site drugs that increase the risk of heat-related illnesses. Now, Regarding the long-term and dehumanizing effect of solitary confinement, the U.S. Supreme Court has acknowledged that the devastating effects of prolonged isolation, even on no more prisoners, a considerable number of prisoners fell after even a short confinement into a semi-fascist condition from which it was next to impossible to arouse them and others became violently insane. Others still committed suicide, while those who stood or stood the ordeal better were not generally reformed, and in most cases, they did not recover sufficient mental activity to be of any subsequent service to the community. That's such a tragedy. Now, to be transparent with everyone for a minute about my own mental health journey, I myself was diagnosed with anxiety and PTSD due to all the trauma I've experienced in my life and due to the grief from the loss of numerous loved ones and friends while I was out and even during my incarceration. You know, my healing journey has been severely hindered due to several of these deficiencies listed that violates the Eighth Amendment right. Now, last April, I began going to therapy once a week. In addition, 
I have court ordered grief counseling to deal with my grief. And then in June, my therapist got another job and my sessions were postponed for about two months. Now, after several requests for psych services, asking them when I would be appointed a new therapist, I was finally called for another session. And I was told that I would be seen twice a month. Now, when it was time for my appointments, the unit staff was playing games and they never informed me that I had an appointment. And they did this twice. And then I had to file a complaint. Then I was finally seen again. Now, in the midst of all this chaos, I lost even more family members and friends to gun violence and even a close friend to suicide. And then two more months passed and there was no follow-up. So I filed another complaint and pleaded for help because I was grieving and I was seen again by another therapist. And this lady, she basically did not take my cry for help serious and was extremely biased in her judgment and she, she could not relate to my situation. And she attempted to outsource her duty to an unlicensed peer specialist, which are another, which are inmates, and then the chaplain. And I have currently filed another complaint, and which that is pending right now because she still has not followed up in two months. And the policy states she must follow up within a couple of weeks. In addition to that, I've also witnessed both of my friends lose their mother, and the prison was negligent in getting them adequate mental health treatment and basically made a mockery of their trauma and basically just ignored them when they was asking for help. Now, I also witnessed my neighbor commit suicide and when he did that, his body was stretched out in front of my cell. And honestly, I truly believe that it could have been prevented if he would have had access to adequate mental health services. Now, the only excuse we receive is they are short stuff, which is understandable, but that's not our problem. We are in their care, and it's their duty to provide an adequate number of mental health staff. And it's no coincidence that during and after the pandemic, the Department of Corrections has experienced a rise in drug use and overdoses. And to be honest, people are hurt and crying out for help, and we're being ignored. And that can lead to other means to cope. In addition to that, when you ask for treatment programs, you get the run around and they tell you your problem. All calls other than properly placed attorney calls may be monitored and recorded. Now, I respectfully ask everyone to keep us in our in your prayers and empathize with us. And if you have loved ones incarcerated, please check on them because this mental health crisis is real and the suicide rate among prisoners is on the rise and the DLC is short staff, so there is no telling when there will be an adequate amount of mental health staff available again. I want to thank everyone again for tuning in and success to you all. And remember, if you don't take nothing else from this message today, protect your mental health by any means necessary. I'm going to pass the mic to my brother, Javon Curtis. Everyone have a blessed day. Hello, once again, and thank you for tuning in. Representing Hood Paralegals, I'm Javon Curtis. Topic at hand today is cruel and unusual punishment, the inadequate physical and mental health care in the Department of Corrections. Today I want to speak on the testimony of Emilio Aguilar at PIOC, Persons in Our Care, as they say. Just a brief summary of Mr. Aguilar. He is a 37-year-old minority, currently incarcerated, and has a few health issues, one of which is him needing a kidney transplant. Now, the Eighth Amendment requires that prison officials provide a system of ready access to adequate medical care. The medical staff must be competent to examine prisoners and diagnose illnesses. These requirements apply to physical, dental, and mental health. What I just stated were elements of an adequate prison health care system, but through my experiences, personal and testimonial, the system is just the opposite. On May 14, 2019, UW sent Mr. Aguilar a letter stating that he has been removed from the transplant list. The reason that stated was non-compliance, which under these conditions are next to impossible. Mr. Aguilar states in a letter to UW Health Clinical Transport Coordinator that they are showing deliberate indifference due to him being incarcerated. The issue of non-compliance for it to have any merit has to come from the Department of Correction staff. Mr. Aguilar states that during his incarceration and prior to, all the requirements were met. Another letter from UW Health Transplant Center just clearly states that Mr. Aguilar was taken off the list due to his inability to stay free of criminal charges. Whether incarcerated or free, a person is entitled to life. 
this is clearly a case of cruel and unusual punishment. We are subject to adequate help being in the custody of DOC. Where is the effort in helping this man receive a procedure that is much needed? DOC records presented to UW Health should show that Mr. Aguirre is meeting all requirements. Instead, there is minimal effort, if, min if any effort at all. Mr. Aguirre has a 12-year sentence. UW Health wrote in a letter telling him that upon his discharge from the Department of Corrections, if the above requirements are met for a minimum of 12 months, he will be re-referred for a kidney transplant. The average life expectancy of a dialysis patient is 5 to 10 years. Upon receiving this information, Mr. Aguirre contemplated taking his own life. Due to his inability to receive adequate health care, his mental health suffered collateral damage. Although numerous letters were wrote to PSU asking for help on ways to cope, none were offered. The only offering was drugs, a basic remedy to slow him down and ease a slow death. In summary, these deficiencies stated are a clear violation of our Eighth Amendment rights which guarantees us to be free from cruel and unusual punishment. The Department of Corrections must be held accountable. Change must come for those that are at risk of irreparable damage before the death comes first. One solution to solve this issue is to reduce the prison population and offer alternative programs. The ability to provide adequate mental health care should be a priority. I repeat, should be a priority. Due to staff shortages, this responsibility is being neglected. Lacoste does not have the death penalty, so why are we subject to a death sentence while in their care? For those of you listening and have loved ones and friends incarcerated, please check on them. I say again, for those of you who have loved ones or friends incarcerated, please check on them. Also, hood paralegals cannot give legal advice. If you have loved ones incarcerated and are experiencing these problems with inadequate mental health care, please encourage them to utilize their prison complaint system to exhaust all remedies before going to the courts. We encourage comments, questions, and all feedback. Till next time, thank you.